Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is David Talbot. I'm Managing Director and Head of Research here at Red Cloud Securities, and I'm delighted to host a Red Cloud webinar on uranium today. We are going to hear from Aero Energy's Interim CEO and Chairman Galen McNamara. Now, during today's webinar, he will provide an overview and outlook, and then he will take some questions. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time, and we'll get to as many as we can. But before we kick things off, first, we need to discuss the fine print. During this Aero Energy webinar, forward-looking statements may be made. I direct listeners to the forward-looking statements outlined on page two of the corporate presentation, and that can be found on the company's website, aeroenergy.com. Uh, sorry, .ca. For Red Cloud Securities, I'd highlight this webinar is for information purposes only. It should not be considered a solicitation or recommendation to buy or sell securities. We note this call does not consider the particular situation or needs of individual investors. Participants should rely on their own investigation and seek their own professional advice before investing. Please see our most recent research located on the Red Cloud website for specific disclosures on Aero Energy. Now, with that said, why don't I turn the floor over to Galen to speak about the company? Great. Thank you very much for the intro, David. And thanks, everyone, on the call for your time today. Today, I'm going to be speaking to you about uh, a new uranium company in the Athabasca Basin called Aero Energy. Um, and you see here on the title page, I've got hunting uranium on the frontier north rim of the Athabasca Basin. And, and I use the term frontier, the word frontier, pretty carefully in this regard, because there's still portions in the basin that really haven't been explored for correctly. Uh, and this is one of them. Uh, you know, even after all these years, these decades and decades of, of prolific production there, going back to the, you know, probably 50 plus years, you know, there's still these areas on the rim of the basin that haven't really been explored and that, you know, we think are very high potential to host, host additional mineralization, uh, especially the basement style hosted mineralization. But I'll get into all those details. So the overview slide here um over 50 shallow drill-ready targets are, have been identified uh, on these projects. Uh, and there's a shortcut to drilling and hopefully discovery because we get to leverage about $7.6 million in recent exploration spend uh, by our project partners and vendors. Uh, this is in Saskatchewan's first uranium district. Uh, it's the Uranium City uh, area where we've got 250,000 acres of mineral rights. We produced something like, the area in total produced something like 70 million pounds of uh, uranium oxide between the 1940s and the 1970s. But these things were generally low-ish grade uh, and, and we're in what we would call today as the wrong rocks. But uh, I'm going to show you that all of the right rocks are there uh, and they're all well, what I would say uranium fertile uh, and just haven't been properly explored. So there's some great new vectors uh, to discovery here. Uh, the team uh, joining me on this one is a is a really uh, well seasoned team of uranium discovery people um, that include uh, Garrett Ainsworth, uh, Dale Varan, uh, Gareth Garlick, and Sean Hilliker. And I'll get into their profiles a little later. Uh, and then and then lastly on this slide, the valuation, which we think is compelling uh, and really could give us a, a good shot at a re rating uh, if we hit you know even just you know just start to hit some. Uh, mineralization on one of these 50 plus targets that we've got. So cap structure before I get into into the details of the properties, uh, 96 million shares outstanding, uh, uh, 120 million fully diluted, uh, which at 18 cents gives us a market cap of about 17 uh, million. We're at 15 cents today, so say that's a little under 15 million today. Uh, we've also got the other things in this in this company that we've got. We own 10 million shares. Uh, of a junior called Minas Metals. Uh, and also there's a gold project in Chile, a couple gold projects in Chile where the best hole is something like uh, 270 meters of 0.8 grams per ton uh, gold, um, which although probably isn't valuable right now, at, right now at some point it will become that way. So here we are looking at the basin. Uh, why Saskatchewan? Um, but let's let's just focus on the map on the on the right here, where the eastern side of the basin is is really where a lot of the historic production has come from. You know, this is where the the Camacos and the Denisons and the Oranos operate. Uh, but then, if we go back, say, you know, ten years to to the southwestern part of the basin, here's Next Gen and Fission. You know, this was an area that pre say you know 2012 2013. 
and nobody ever really looked at and it was i would say overlooked but you fast forward 10 years plus to now and of, and of course there's now hundreds of millions of pounds of uranium discovered well you know here's our projects up here and i see something you know quite similar where it hasn't really been looked at this area hasn't really been looked at by modern exploration people uh and all of the hallmarks are there for something big to be hiding okay so zooming into the projects uh the the blue polygons are, are our projects and there's a mix of staked claims and claims that we've optioned from two different groups so first i'm just going to point out the staked claims uh this one uh, uh excuse me this one and this one uh, and then these, uh, these three, I'll, I'll make X's as I get using this annotation tool, are things that we've, are projects that we've optioned from uh, Standard Uranium uh, and uh, Fortune Bay Corp. Let me turn that off. Uh, everywhere where there's a little dot on this map, that little, call it bullseye, um, that's where there's a uranium showing at surface. And you can go and you can sample, you know, up to, excuse me, up to 27% here. 10% U308 here, but generally these are in the wrong types of rocks where, you know, we're looking for graphites that host the big uranium deposits. Generally, these are in the wrong types of rocks, but for us as exploration people, that just really shows us that in my mind, you know, these areas have a lot of uranium around. They're very well endowed with the metal. And also all of the right rocks are here. You know, it, although it's not shown on this map, I'll get into that, you know, and all of the right rocks are here uh, and they're just not really explored. And when I talk about right rocks versus wrong rocks, um, looking at the, this is just a little, a bit of a diagram that helps just explain that a, a little more clearly in what I hope is a simple way. So generally in the, the old timers between the 40s and the 80s, we're looking for, I'm going to turn the whiteboard back on and draw, you know, came across things like this. It's on high ground. Uh, generally, they're small pods. It's anything that a prospector can walk over with a handheld scintillometer. And if he gets any, any indications of radioactivity, he starts digging. Sometimes it works out. Most of the time, it didn't work out for them. But what they didn't know of at the time and, and, and really couldn't have seen were these, uh, these targets that generally are under valley and overburden. Um, that weather low because they're fault zones. Um, couldn't see them because you know you get no indication of radioactivity at surface in those areas. And these are the things, these things that are graphitic, graphite, fault zones. And these are the things that host the big basement hosted deposits, you know, like the fissions of the world, like the next gens of the world. They're all there and they aren't really that well explored. And where they are explored in, in preliminary first pass drilling, you know, there's lots of good sniffs in the right rocks that really require quick follow-up. Okay, so now now zooming into the first set of projects. This is called these are called the Mermac and the Sundog projects. Here we are on the map uh, uh, on the right. I usually always like to concentrate on the maps instead of talking to points on the slide. Uh, but there's two projects here that under two separate option agreements. The first is uh, Mermac. That's this one. The second is Sundog. That's this one. And where we're starting is we're looking at a, a cumulative strike length of 30 kilometers where we know that there are a bunch of, of good, we call them EM conductor corridors. Now that's the, that's the host rock of the high grade basement deposits where you can go and sample like starting at the Northeast, 1.69% U308, 6.9% U308, you know, 8% U308 um, on and around those conductors. That, that just tells us that they're just kind of almost leaking uranium. And now where's the big vein hosted deposit? There's also things, you know, 15,000 counts per second in a radioactive spring, 3,000 counts per second in a radioactive spring on those conductors. Well, that's where you can walk up and there'll be a natural groundwater seep. Uh, and you can take your scintillometer and get things like 15,000 counts per second, which is very, very, very rare. Uh, moving more to the southwest, uh, you know, I've got Stewart Island and Johnston Island labeled here. I'll just circle them to orient your eye. This and this, where you can go and you can sample in the sandstone there. You can sample 9.5% U308, 12% U308. 
you know, yeah, I'm, I'm cherry picking. Those are those are selected high grade samples from old results uh, in the uh, exploration records in Saskatchewan. Uh, but it's anywhere from, say, 0.1 to those in, in the sandstone and the sandstone sits above the unconformity. And, and when we have mineralization like that above the unconformity in the sandstone, we call it perched mineralization. And it's a great sign for, OK, well, yeah, those zones are probably relatively small, but what's below them? Where is that coming from? What's feeding that? And, and those two targets for, for us uh, look very prospective. The last thing I want to just point out on the slide is the Haven target. That's this. That's where one of our the project uh, vendors, Standard Uranium, uh, drilled a hole last year that you know got a sniff, you know, like five centimeters or 10 centimeters, excuse me, a 0.05% U308, which is like, okay, who cares? But in that situation, like looking at the core uh, in our experience in in uh, uranium, especially at the aero deposit, you know, that we just saw a lot of real similarities there in all of the smoke, call it just smoke around the mineralization that looked really prospective. So that needs follow up uh, as well. Uh, okay, so the next slide, we're just going to zoom into this, this area, and I'll just show you some you know, more specific targets and, and kind of our approach here. Uh, okay. So here we are zooming into to the Mermac project. There's three corridors there. There's the Howland corridor, the Armbruster corridor, and the Pitchvane corridor. And you see all these bullseyes there. It looks like a bit of a shotgun approach. Like those are all drill targets. It looks like a bit of a shotgun approach, but really, you know, that's the opposite of what we're looking at here. These are all very carefully chosen targets based on a number of things. Two types of geophysics, uh, structural analysis, the geology, uh, you know, going and prospecting and seeing hey you know here's here's some of the grades at surface excuse me and here's some of the grades in in early drill holes where in the right rocks you know in those graphitic conductors you get 0.18 percent yeah it's only over 10 centimeters or something like that but for us as uranium exploration people like that is like really 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 perspective so what we're going to do starting on this one uh, which we're now fully funded for is we're planning an initial 4,000 meters in about 20 holes uh to start and the nice thing about this area is that, okay, so the holes uh, on average are 200 meters deep. Uh, so with 4,000 meters, you get more or less 20 shots on goal here as a start. Um, there's 45 targets identified. So we're in the process now of working through which ones we want to prioritize first. Um, and we're going to share that you know, a, a lot more on that as things progress uh, over the next couple months. So how does this corridor uh, between the Sundog and the Mermac project compare to say you know, the Patterson corridor where there's been over $5 billion in value creation that you know, myself and Garrett Ainsworth had really had front row seats to, you know, in the last decade. Um, and I'm not, I'm, and I'm just, this is just a high level comparison. I'm not saying one is the other by any means, but this is the type of shot that we're trying to take here where, okay, on the map on the right, those are the projects that we're working on. You know, we've got a 30 kilometer long trend of uh, the right rocks, those conductive corridors that you know all along them appear to be leaking uranium and haven't really seen much or any modern exploration. Uh, you know, here on the other side, hey, between Triple R and and uh, Arrow and Spitfire, you know, you've got 450 million pounds there, and that's over 13 kilometers. So if we can get onto something, you know, on our projects at at Mermac and Sundog, um, really the, you know, we really, I don't like, to, I, I was always going to use a, a bad cliche, like the sky's the limit, but, you know, really like that we could get onto something very significant. And that's the type of shot that we're trying to take here. Uh, this slide is just a, a timeline of the same type of, you know, the, the, the discovery curve or the discovery process and where in development process really at Patterson versus, uh, you know, where we're working, you know, between now, uh, that's 20, 2023 and 2011, you know, when they first discovered the boulder fields, you know, there was a lot that happened now. And where are we compared to that? Well, I think we're kind of, hopefully, you know, we, we, the proof is going to be in the pudding but I think we could just be at the start of that, you know, if things go well for us here. Okay, so the next project I'm gonna talk about is the strike project. That's just to the Northwest of the two projects we looked at before. You know, I don't think I need to go through all the details on this one because I'm just gonna be repeating more or less high level what you know, I was discussing on the last couple slides, but this one is also interesting, undrilled conductors that again, appear to 
you know, have uranium mineralization on them. And the most interesting one, we think, uh, is this, this thing called the tenazone. And that's this guy right here uh, and this, where that isn't mineralization in, you know, quote unquote, the wrong rocks. That's in the graphitic conductors. The grade is higher at 0.6 to 3.5%. Uh, and, you know, they mined it the thousand tons or something came out of there in the 1950s. So for us, that's like a proof of concept that those basement zones are there. And now where is a bigger one, right? It's kind of like this thing feels like it's been hiding in the open uh, a little bit. And all of these things that are, you know, that are generally lower grade and in quote unquote the wrong rocks, you know, those are just a bit of a smoke screen here um, that, that I think is maybe mm, slowed things down from a modern perspective. So this one, you know, we have generally have about a thousand meters planned in, in five holes, again, 200 meter average hole depth. So you get, you know, a lot of shots on goal for not, not that many meters, which means your exploration dollars go further. But let, let's keep going. So what are we doing uh, coming up here? Uh, we just finished raising $5.9 million, uh, and that's really going to allow us to hit hit the field running here. Uh, we're starting some geophysics, I would say, very, very soon, planning to be drilling in early June with the idea of testing to start, although we have 50 drill-ready targets, you know, let's start by testing, say, 25 of those uh, and, and just speed to discovery is really important in these markets you know so we want to test it as much as we can as quickly as we can so so start drilling in june you know, test 25 targets over the time and and 5000 ish meters you know over the the period of probably between 2 or 3 months depending on how things go up there and then we'll have a really good understanding you know of what we may have on our hands we'll have a good first pass of things done although the projects are large there's lots of targets and there's going to be lots to do So, okay, so how do, how do we compare in terms of some, some of the comps? And this needs to be updated. You know, our market cap now is more like uh, 14, 15, but that's close enough for now. You know, compare that to some of the companies out there that are, you know, are, are, are much respected peers, say a COSA or a baseload. You know, I, I think that we have, you know, some catching up to do uh, in, in, terms of, um, in terms of valuation. Uh, and of course, we all know like the, the really big wins out there, like the F3s or the ISOs. Well, you know, what was F3 valued at before their $200 million, give or take today? You now, before they made the discovery of the thing that they're working on now, um, you know, what, what was it? Probably between 20 and $30 million. So, I mean, that's like a 10x valuation increase there. You know, that's the type of shot that companies like ours are definitely trying to take. Uh, the board of directors, uh, management and the board of directors. Um, I, I think I'm just going to, you know, I, I, this is a this is a new company, um, and I think what I want to concentrate on team here is actually the technical team. So I'm going to do that. Why don't I start by introducing myself because I'm on this slide. Um, myself, Galen, you know, co-founder of the company and geologist with you know give or take 15 years of experience uh, in the field and now in the capital markets, but. Between 20, my, my relevant experience here is that between 2014 and 2018, I was heavily involved in the drill out of the Aero deposit for NextGen uh, and really got to see and plan out all that drilling, but really, really got to experience, you know, uh, that, you know, from one rig at site to eight rigs at site and how does that work and how do we actually build a world-class deposit, right? So I, I see that's that experience that I'm, applying here put it that way but joining me on this one uh, my former boss from next gen garrett ainsworth who was the uh, the vp exploration there um at the time and of course was the guy who discovered the boulder fields that led to you know also his eventual discovery of the triple r zone so i think it's pretty safe to say that garrett has had a a uh, a big influence on most of the pounds that were discovered in the southwestern portion of the athabasca basin uh, an, another gentleman that is is highly successful is Dale Varan. He's one of the project vendors through Fortune Bay Corp. Uh, he was the former VP Exploration for Denison. Um, discovered things like uh, discovered things like Phoenix and Griffin with with that team. Uh, his geologist Gareth Garlic, uh, formerly of Mineral Services Canada, you know worked pretty pretty closely or, or pretty 
uh, yeah, pretty closely on the triple R deposit and, and other things like the J zone. Uh, and then the last gentleman, Sean Hilker, who's the VP exploration for standard uranium, another one of the project vendors, uh, worked with us very closely uh, at next gen going back to 2014 and concentrated on the, the more academic geology side of research, but, but also um, the, the exploration management pretty heavily as well. So I, Getting close to the end here, but but one of the last things I want to talk about, I think very importantly, the option terms uh, on both of these projects. Um, so we look at uh, the Sundog project, that's in total 650,000 cash, 650,000 shares, and a $6.5 million work commitment over three years. Uh, the first of which is paid, so this 200 in cash and 200 in shares is paid. Uh, and then for the strike in Mermac properties, those come from standard, uh, excuse me, uh, Fortune Bay Corp. Um, for those ones, we're looking at uh, a, a more of a stepwise earn in, um, but it's it's 1.35 million in cash, 2.15 million in stock, and and a six million dollar work commitment uh, over three and a half years uh, for a, a 70 percent ownership portion in that. And again, the first payment has been made. So really, I, when I was asking myself, okay, like is this a good deal or not? You know, I look at these prices and I say, okay, well. $7.6 million has been invested, you know, by these two companies in these projects, really like getting these targets ready to go, getting all these targets ready to go. Some first pass drilling that got some great snips. They're all permitted, uh, drill ready. Um, these companies both have uh, uh, exploration agreements with the local First Nations. So, it, I mean, it's really like a, we are able to hit the ground running here, which, which for me, when I kind of put all that together in my head, I thought, geez, that's a really rare opportunity in what is uh, looking like a really good uranium market. And, and that's it. That's, you know, that's the last, this is the last slide, you know, 50 shallow drill ready targets. And when I say shallow targets, you know, I, I like to say, okay, well, this area is a little bit more remote. It is, it's on the north side of the basin. So drilling is a little bit more expensive, but let's say we can do it for um, very conservatively. I hope to beat this, say $500 a meter uh, all in. Each one of your holes are 200 meters long. So $500 per meter times 200 meters long, that's $100,000 per shot on goal. I think that's probably the best you're gonna get anywhere in the basin. And for me, that that's really how I think about it. You know, wh you know how what, what's bang for your buck? You know, how much is the cost per test is a really important metric. Obviously, Saskatchewan is a tier one jurisdiction, great uranium producing uh, in place, and you know, always has been, and probably always will be, at least for the very foreseeable future. Uh, and a great team. Um, which I just went over. And and lastly, you know, the valuation, I think we've got a lot of catching up to do compared to our peers, especially if we can start to hit something. So, so that's it. Thanks very much for your time. And I'm now very happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Galen. Uh, great presentation there. I, uh, I've been fortunate to be involved in the uranium sector, living through all these discoveries as well. Phoenix, Griffin, J-Zone, Triple R, Arrow, all, all the ones that you're technical advisors have accomplished over the last 15 years or so. So I think you are in good hands. So mm -hmm. so we will now start the question and answer uh, portion of the webinar. Reminder to everybody online, you can type your questions into the chat box at any time. So we've already got a few a few questions here lined up, Galen. Uh, when, when did you decide to work in the Uranium City area of the Athabasca Basin? Because, you know, I'd say yeah. that there's already more activity there in this cycle than there was during the last cycle or two. So, you know what, going back to 20, like 15 time, I got pretty interested in it um, because there's so much uranium up there and, and what is it and where's the big one, right? So I, 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 and I would have these conversations with, with my colleagues at NextGen, like, you know, one example is, is Troy Beaujolais who now runs Atha and they have a big, you know, a big exploration ground projects around there as well that you know we i remember having these conversations thinking like why isn't there a bigger one there right should there be and, and we both thought kind of yeah okay there's lots of snips around so that was when i first got interested but but you know and then you file that and then fast forward what till 20 till yeah it was till september 2023 when i got to looking again in the area just looking for claims because that's what i always do um and staked a bunch of ground that ended up being the stuff now that we have staked uh, but then thought to myself, okay, like, you know, these are just state claims. Like, all the work we're going to have to do here to get even ready to drilling is is going to take ages. It's going to take a long time, a year, more. Um, was looking around and thought, okay, well, what if we can start piecing together other projects where, 
you know, where the sum of the part, the sum of the parts is more than the pieces, right? Where if you put everything together, all of a sudden now you can take a, you're looking at 30 kilometers of strike, right? And you, and you can have this bigger picture exploration story. And I thought to myself, I think that's something that would be, you know, very, very intriguing. I think that we'd have a real good shot at discovery. Um, and I thought, you know, if now is the time to, to do that, right? Now is the time to take, in terms of market conditions, to take these, these shots at big new discoveries. So that, now, was, that was a long-winded way to answer that question. Sorry. <laughs> no worries, no worries. So now you did mention that you've got about 50 of these shallow drill-ready targets. You know, what are you mm -hmm. really looking for in a target? And then what would you like to find in a successful drill hole? You know, I guess high-grade uranium notwithstanding. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so to, I'm going to answer the first, the, the second part of that first. You know, I think we're drilling every hole with the goal of making a discovery, right? I don't think that we're drilling holes just to prospect with the drill bit by any means and to kind of say, okay, well, here's this, here's that. Like, oh, I'm, it's not a science project. Every hole is 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 shooting for, a, really is shooting for a discovery. And what does that mean? Well, you know, that's a that's a really good question. I, I think personally, uh, you, you know, like when you real, a, a real serious uranium discovery, and you, and you probably don't get this on the, you might not get this on the first hole. It would be very, very rare to get it on the first hole. A real serious uranium discovery is a GT that's 100. So maybe that's 10 meters of 10%, or maybe that's 5 meters of 20%, or, you know, you can do the math on, on either side, right? We can do the math on either side. So that's really the, the size of the prize we're looking for. And in terms of how we just how we choose these targets, well, you know, we, we look for things that overlap each other, anomalies that overlap each other, and take as many facets of that as we can to build these targets. So for what we're going to look for is, yeah, those conductors are 30 kilometers long, and there's multiple versions of them. But we if we have gravity over top of them, gravity data, you know, and we see gravity lows, and if we see a conductor weakening over a gravity low, you know, just the way what we know about how these targets, how these deposits form, that's a great target. And if there's a cross cutting structure that comes through there as well, I mean, that's a good structural tra trap. So uh, maybe I'm getting too far into the weeds, but you, you read the tea leaves uh, and 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 do the best you can. But the thing is, in my experience, in these types of situations, there's a lot of you, you really need to test as much as you can. You know, because a lot of things that exploration is difficult. It's not like one target and like, oh, this is the one it's going to hit. You know, it might be like your fifth one or your 10th one. You never know. Mm -hmm. No, I, th I think Arrow was lucky. Yeah, I think they hit on the 16th. So, it, yeah. yeah, it was something it was something like that. That's right. And, and you know, they were concentrating on a different area for six months before that, like a completely different area yep. and getting some sniffs. Yep. Yeah, no, where there's smoke, there's fire. I think that's what, you, yeah. what you're looking for. So, so it is an interesting geological targeting model. You're you're really not interested in the big high grade beaver lodge deposits. You're you know the the 0.2 to 0.5 percent deposits. You want to find the bigger and even higher grade basement hosted deposits. So, why why do you believe these exist in the northwest Athabasca but just haven't been found yet? Yeah. Well, uh, number. So why? Why do we believe they exist? Okay, so you've got all of the hallmarks of why they should be there. You have the the graphitic conductor rocks. Those conductors are uranium fertile. They're you know they're leaking uranium where you can go and drill drill things and get like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 over narrow areas. There's a sh over narrow intersections. There's a showing that tena zone that I that I showed you on the on the strike property. That's a thousand tons at 0 0.6 to 3.5 percent on a conductor and that's way too high grade to be one of these beaver lodge style things because those run 0 0.2 0 0.4 like 0.25 really so those two those things right there that's a that's a bit of a proof of concept for me it's like okay i i look at these things in that okay like when i'm doing exploration for anything and, re and really it's just to keep it really simple like a, a metal source metal path metal trap like okay the source we know that there is a source somewhere because there's uranium all over the place the paths are there in terms of the graphitic conductors and the faults, and the trap is there in terms of the graphite itself and the structural intersections that cause place things to open up, right? So all those three things are there. Now, why haven't they been found yet? They really haven't been looked for. They really haven't been looked for. Uh, 
But there was a lot of work to do on the eastern side of the basin, and there still is, and there's still discoveries to be made there. There's a lot of work to do on this newly emerged southwestern, southwestern side of the basin. And I mean, NextGen just made a new discovery. They announced what last week, right, or the week before, mm-hmm. right? So you know that that is, in my opinion, why things haven't really been discovered. And then, and then lastly, it's like we've got all of these low-grade showings in the Beaver Lodge style zones. You know, sometimes they get to be twenty million pounds plus, right? You've got those low grade showings, and I think that's a smokescreen, you know, where it's really easy to say, okay, well, there's just these low grade things around. Let's not look over here, right? You have to kind of get back and dig deep for attention. Okay, you've got two separate partners here Standard and Fortune Bay, who's very successful and experienced uh, technical teams are doing work on your respective options. Are they speaking to each other, you know, sort of helping maintain consistency and regional perspective across property boundaries? Oh, yeah. Oh, like, I, we're, we're not going to do this in silos. We are working together um, very regularly. Uh, we have weekly meetings where we all plan and think and talk about ideas together. Yeah, this is very much a group effort for for all of the projects. And you're one hundred percent on ground. Do you have any idea of which technical team might tackle exploration on the on that property? On those yeah, properties? I think that you know what, I, I don't yet, you know, to be honest with you. We haven't really even started thinking about that too hard yet. Um, but you know, that that'll you know, as time goes on, uh, you know, we'll we'll get to those and get to starting to explore those uh, as well. Because there are great showings on them. That we know that there's those conductors are on some of those projects as well. So uh, let's just see how things develop here in the next six to 12 months. Okay. So how much cash do you have on hand and what are your exploration requirements for this year specifically? Yeah. So we're about, uh, we're a little over $6 million on hand. Uh, I've got a hundred thousand dollars also to a drill contractor, which I think is important. Uh, and then, and then this year, um, it's, it, I think our, uh, our commitments are for $2.5 million in total just to maintain the option agreement. So we're completely funded to, to do that for this year. But uh, I think that speed to market and speed to discovery is really important right now. Mm-hmm. I think okay. that it's a. I think that it's a junk. I think that just to, let me build build on that just briefly. It's like it's kind of like I feel like in this new uranium market, it's a jump ball for uh, all these uh, several companies like ours and new entrants all the time. It's a jump ball, and I think whoever makes the discovery first has some great advantages, you know, in the capital markets. So that's you know, that's my position is is to move as quickly as we can. Mm-hmm. Okay, so move as quickly as you can. So what is the timing on expiration this year and, and what sort of programs do you plan to carry out? Yeah, so I mean, let's start with the most important thing is drilling, right? So we're planning to be drilling by June for, by early June, say, um, and, and just hopscotch around to all of as many targets as we can you know, over the summer. Uh, and and the, the thing is, like we should be, the nice thing about uranium expiration is that, you know, you have radio out, you can see the, the, the radioactivity of the rocks give you a lot, right? So let's say we're going to drill 20 to 25 holes and 5,000 meters, you know, is what we're funded for and ready to go on now, which is 25 shots on goal is, is good. That's a lot. So that's one. The other exploration we're going to do is we've got some geophysics budgeted too. So we're going to be starting a VTEM survey here, you know, in the next, say, couple weeks. Uh, a lot of the project uh, between Strike and Mermac, the one I was showing you, the main one I was showing you, doesn't really have modern uh, EM, modern airborne EM. So we need a data set that's, that we can work with and infill some other spots on the project that will just help us give us greater resolution. So you know, things like that, more gravity. We'll be building up more targets as we go because these 50 that we have, the 25 or test, the 50 that we have, I mean, there's going to be many more, right? So let's understand all of them. And I'm sure you'll prioritize as you go. What's that? You'll you'll prioritize these as you go. The more information you get, Absolutely. some targets may look better than others. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. So the company looks like it has about 43% owned by management insiders, 36 by uh, percent by high net worth and in institutions, which typically is fairly stable as well. Uh, but only about 20% of the 21% of your stock is owned by retail. Is, and I, I think often that's the crowd that provides li- liquidity. Is that something you're concerned yeah. about right now? Is that something? You no, it's a, it's a new story. Not, no, it's a new story. And this is something that we need to, we need to build over time. Right. That's, that's why I, 
you know, it's my goal and our goal to to introduce this company and the opportunity to as many people as we can, retail, institutional, high net worth, whatever, right? And I find just in, in my experience that changes over time, for sure, mm -hmm. that, that mix. Okay. And I guess last question here, the, the Minus Metals and the Chilean gold assets, would you, would you consider these non-core and, and seek to divest them to help pay for your exploration? Or is this, are those Completely. something you're going to hold on to for a while? No, go, go no those, those aren't core. Those aren't core. We just want to make sure that we get as, especially with the Chilean gold asset, you know, we want to see that we get as much value as possible there. It's very okay. cheap to hold and there's a gold deposit that I think is significant based on my experience and my professional opinion on the, on the project. Yep. If only we had a better gold market, but we do yeah, have a right. great uranium market. So, yeah. so with that, uh, Galen McNamara from Aero Energy, uh, thank you for joining us today. Okay. Well, thanks very much, David. And thanks everyone for your time. Thank you everybody else for tuning in. Our next webinar is going to be tomorrow. That's Thursday, March 21st, when Taylor is going to sit down with Kessel Run Resources. So have a great day, everyone. And thank you for supporting Red Cloud's webinar series.